So, welcome back, listeners, to Off Over 50 and Fired. Now what with Linda? And Shelly. So, Shelly, last time we started part one of our Getting Social series, which featured our past colleague, Prang, talking about networking the old-fashioned way with past colleagues and strategic partners. And today, Linda, we'll be getting social through network meetings. However, I wonder what you're going to be saying next. Let's first start with our wine recommendation, which is Basso, a Tuscan from the Donzelli family winery in Italy. Cheers. Cheers. So our second one-off guest about getting social is Scott. Scott, he's the king of network meetings. He attends at least two to four a week. Even Scott's volunteering is due to the result of networking. Pretty amazing. That is amazing. So welcome back, Scott. It's great to be here again, Linda and Shelley. Well, thanks, Scotty. So previously when you were on, you talked about the use of LinkedIn to build your network with the ultimate goal of getting that real life meeting. So now we want to talk to you about real life meetings. Right. It's very important. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is between all your LinkedIn activity and your real time life network meetings, how do you have time to really engage with your real life? Sometimes it's hard to find the time. I might go to three meetings on a Thursday and then go play paddle after the last meeting. So yeah, it can be juggling, you know, and I might not be able to find time to eat or I might have to change clothes in the parking lot. That's the kind of things that you, you got to do to fit everything in. Okay. But you're finding ways to squeeze things in, which is Oh, really absolutely. Cool. So Scott, for some of our listeners, maybe we want to talk a little bit about what are the different types of network meetings that you go to and you, how do you distinguish why do you go to some and not others? There's so many different types of networking meetings. What would be kind of a classic network meeting where you exchange your elevator speeches and also give out your targets and then people respond whether they know any of these or not and you'll get feedback on your elevator speech. And sometimes those are paid. Sometimes those are sponsored by outplacement centers. There's people that have job search boot camps where you learn about resumes and learn about writing cover letters, learn about writing thank you notes. Uh, They might have interviewing weeks in those and might have kind of a a scorecard every quarter of, of how you're doing on these things. Let me think. There's also job search groups, what's called the job search work group. And those are more focused, what's also known as accountability partners. Uh, where you might have a team of like eight or 10 people and they'll split up into twos or threes and work on supporting each other and and making each other accountable for their actions every week. So can I ask you a question, Scott? Sure. How do you find out about all these networking opportunities? Because what you've listed or talked about, there's a whole boatload of stuff out there. So how do you find them? Great place to start is maybe your religious organization that you're a part of. There's also libraries have notifications on these. Your outplacement groups will help you on this. Get on the internet and I'm in tech, so I just search like NYC and tech and events and or CT tech and events, or I might go to Meetup. I might go to Eventbrite. There's this thing called Gary's Guide, which is a website that keeps track of all NYC events. If you're in a major metropolitan, then there's, there's going to be websites dedicated to kind of these activities. Well, that's great. So it sounds like there's a whole bunch of ways to really find all this stuff, which is cool. And thank you for listing some of those because for me, I'm clueless. So it's, it's great to hear that. It seems like there's a lot of network meetings that you're involved in or that you've identified to help you. How did you figure out which ones are valuable to you? One of the things is you got to feel good about the people that you meet there. Another thing is, is there a decent attendance? And are you finding people that are helping you in your search? I think those are, you know, really big criteria. And for some people, it's going to be also, what's it cost me to do this activity? There's meetups that are free. There's meetups that cost money. Your networking group may be completely free. It may be a a paid group that it's $40, $50 to be part of, but maybe you're getting good contacts out of that and and good leads every week. So it's, it's worth the $40. 
And it sounds like chemistry is probably a really important component, right? I mean, if you're meeting with people and you feel like, oh my God, I don't like that person, they're, you know, do you think chemistry is important? I don't know if it's purely chemistry, but there's groups that you might not find you can find any common ground with. So you should look for groups at least that have like similar areas that you're either looking for job searching or that have some sort of connection to what you're doing or what you're looking for in your opportunity. It's really great if you can find groups that are related to your opportunity, but if you're attending like a job search work group, which is something that you might have a a speaker and and you talk about good news, you celebrate landings of people. That's a group where you're going to get some support, where you really, you like the people that you're going to be there with, if you're going to attend it week after week. But there's other groups that may be much more in your area. Like I attend a Pulse local group, which is a customer success group. I also attend an IOT group because that's an area of interest that I might want to get into for my next role. So there's all kinds of things that can be specific or something that you do to help you with your search. But it does sound like, if we go back to the chemistry thing, if what I heard you just say is, if you're going to do a network meeting that might be ongoing, right. it's good to have that chemistry. But if it's something that's like short-term, hit or miss, who gives a shit? You know, you don't have to like them, but if you're going to get some information from them, some good information, some good contacts, that's great. But if it's longer term... You probably want to like the people a little bit. Exactly. Cool. Okay, so Scott, just tell us what actually happens in a network meeting. It really depends uh, on what the meeting is about. Generally, a lot of these have speakers. Sometimes an opportunity to ask something of the community. Get up and say something, you know, for a cause you're interested in or uh, a business venture that you're starting. In fact, one of the ones I went to, I actually did a a plug for your podcast. Well, thanks, Scott. That was very nice of you. It is. We appreciate it. We appreciate the marketing. Absolutely. We'll take anything we can get. The job search work group, generally there's a speaker and generally you, you have a period where you talk about other events that are out there. That's another place that you can learn about other events is your 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 job search networking groups then at the end have some kind of wrap up of what's coming up who the next speaker is or whatnot and some extra networking before or after the the meeting so scott since you're the king of networking do you find that along your journey you've gotten better at doing it certainly better than than at the beginning there's a lot that i i still could improve upon, but I'm comfortable at least getting out there and making sure if I go to an event, I talk to people, whether it be a job fair, whether it be, you know, a room of three, 400 people or, you know, a group of 20 to to talk to somebody new or or ask new questions of a contact that I know. So in in the journey that you've had in doing all the networking and this real real-time networking. Have you found techniques or stuff to make it easier to get started when you're in a meeting and you're trying to engage with others in the meeting? It's always a good thing to go maybe engage the speaker if you can pick them out of the the lineup beforehand. Another thing that is always good if you're a little bit shy, go take a picture with somebody. I've heard Some speakers say, you know, if it's a big event and there's food or whatnot, you know, you you might comment to somebody about the food or or talk about the wine, something just to to start the conversation. I think that's really good. I I know that one of our um, past folks, Joey B, he talked about how when he went to networking, you know, he's not... He's kind of like a Shelly shut in too, you know, he, he's not really out there socializing as much, but he would look for the most uh, uncomfortable person in the room and then you go up and talk to them because you thought, sure, shit, they're, gonna, they're uncomfortable. I'm going to have a good conversation with them because they're out of their skin right now. So that's really good, good that you can do those things. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it gets easier as, as you go, but sometimes it's just not easy to engage that first person. And having, you know, a couple other things that you can use to start engaging people helps you make it worthwhile, you know, because whether you pay for the event or not, it's your time and and you're trying to make progress in your journey. 
So I like those little tips and tricks. If you're really not good at it and it's brandy new and you're a little uncomfortable, you could think about how do I maybe get a picture with the, you know, the, the guest speaker or whatever. How do I talk about the food and the wine or some things just to kind of help you break the ice, right? And the great thing is I like doing pictures because then it also gives you something to share on LinkedIn. And you can tell a story about I met this person, they do X, Y, Z, or they were our speaker and... Here's why they're important. It really is another way to take your live networking and, and put it out there in another way. That's interesting to bring value. We talked about the value of the posting and commenting. And here's a way of bringing some of that real life now into LinkedIn. Yeah, you're getting more exposure, which is really cool. Excellent. So, Scott, you've gone to so many of these events. Are there some that kind of stand out? Is there a speaker or two that uh, was memorable? Certainly, there's several out there that that have been memorable. One of the best ones that I've been to on our job search work group is a woman named Absolutely Abby. She uh, got her start in uh, the recession of 2008-2009, and and her deal was she quit her job as a recruiter and decided, I'm going to go help a million people get jobs. And she had this illustrious idea of having a big motor home and traveling around the, the country, having all these sponsored people, sponsored groups, maybe like LinkedIn and, and maybe Monster or something like that, be on, on her motor home as she toured the country. Well, it, it never got to the point where she got that sponsorship, but she's been on like Good Morning America and other talk shows and she does webinars and other events that she is able to help people with their LinkedIn. And she's also will allow you to buy some of her time. So somehow she got her time management really well that she can go take these trips and go around the country and help people. So what do you mean by buy some of her time? You buy her time to help you for coaching. For a personal perspective. Also for personal yeah. coaching. Okay. Yeah. So a uh, consultation. Yeah. And she's reasonable as it goes. She Generally, if you engage her after an event, it's, it's like $147 for an hour of her time or $150, something like that. So curious, does she uh, fly to these events now or is she RVing? Well, it, it's, it's funny that you mention it. Her trailer's sitting somewhere in Florida. So she tries to fly. I mean, she's kind of New Jersey-based. So when she visits one of the groups up here in Connecticut, she you know, just drives a car. So absolutely, Abby, you must love that name, Shelley. I do. I do. I think it's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. <laughs> so any, any other speakers or? Recently, I, I saw Rob Thomas and it's not the Rob Thomas of Matchbox 20. It's Rob Thomas of Connecticut. And he is kind of authority on networking and He's got some interesting techniques that he's shared. One of them being, you ought to try to drop in on a on a on either a customer or on a potential employer after you've established a relationship with them. What do you mean by drop in? Like just go and visit them in the office? Try to go and visit them in the office. Well, how do you make sure that somebody doesn't think you're stalking them? Or that they're available to even see you? Well, they, they may not be available, but it establishes that your interest. He's also very big on personal thank you letters. One of the things he would say, at least if you're, you're purely on it from a business level, never take anybody's card without them or never give your card away without them asking for it. And if you want somebody's card, you should ask for it, not have them give it to you. I see. So wait for it to be asked right. for the card. That makes sense. Yeah, so you're not kind of being pushy. You're not being a, a, a pushy pal, uh, penny. A pushy penny. A pushy penny. A pushy penny. I like that. <laughs> no pushy pennies. <laughs> no. Hey, you're not supposed to come up with these little fun I'm little sorry. names and phrases. You, That's you, my job. You got me started. <laughs> Um, do some of these network meetings allow for like virtual participation? So if you're not lucky enough to be in the area where the event is, do you find that they're on Twitter or they do live Facebooks or live YouTubes or things like that? That's beginning to start. 